Uh, well, well, welcome back. Uh, my last guest arrived with one minute to spare. My present one has arrived with about ten minutes not to spare. Uh, but uh, we, we are going to seize the, seize the moment. Uh, Rory Stewart, who is well known, I'm sure, to you all. I heard a wonderful, uh, just talking, just before we came in, I was talking to somebody who said, yes, Rory Stewart, he's somebody who really knows what he's talking about despite being a politician, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was a very good introduction. But uh, we're, we, we don't really know what we're going to talk about, but we do know what the overriding subject is, and it's borders, which is a very, very good topic for this festival. So I'm going to ask Rory just to kick off, and then we'll pick up and, and, and have a discussion. Well, th thank you all very, very much indeed for coming. My first very big apology uh, is that I don't really have a map, and I'm going to be talking about borders. So I think rather than irritating you by pointing to this map that you won't be able to see, uh, I'm going to have to do my best to try to describe the map of the area I'm talking about and, and hope that you can imagine it. It is an area which should be relatively familiar to you because it is indeed the English-Scottish border, not very far from here. And just before we, we get on to more of a conversation debate with Magnus, I just wanted to lay out a couple of very uh, early thoughts about the border. And of course, the reason I'm laying out these thoughts is indeed there is a suggestion that next year in September, we may indeed end up with a very serious border between England and Scotland again. So I want you to begin on the Solway Firth. How many people in this room have been to the Solway Firth? Oh, look at that. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. So imagine yourself standing about half a mile off the north coast of England in the Solway Firth, looking at the Scottish shore. So behind you, 30 miles of England. In front of you, about 40 miles of Scotland. You are looking at one of the great natural frontiers of the world, the meeting point between two completely independent continents 400 million years ago. Scotland floated down, attached to America. England floated up from somewhere down the South Pole, attached until very recently to Europe. And then, having kissed and touched, began to lose their hinterland. A great chasm emerged between Scotland and America, and a rather smaller stream emerged between England and France. But still to this very day, if you were to cross the Solway Firth, you would find mollusks and fossils on the Scottish side of the border, which are indeed American in origin, which are not present on the English side of the border. However, that was a very, very long time ago, very long time before there were rhinos wandering around under the current site of the British Museum. When we move forward into the beginnings of known history, which is really the arrival of the Romans in Britain, there are no frontiers or borders of that sort. And the basic contrast I want to make is between what I will call very vulgarly a natural border and an artificial border. The Romans turn up and there are umpteen different groups, different gens, different nations, different tribes. We know that with three kings sitting in Kent alone. Ptolemy lays out about 12 little tribal groups up in what's now Scotland. But even that list isn't complete. Every time we uncover a new milestone somewhere near Penrith, as we did in 1994, we discover a new Iron Age tribal group, in that case, the Carvetti. And in a recent article from 2005, an academic has identified a now not even named Iron Age group just south of Emont Bridge adjoining the Carvetti. These were people who we believe, sitting in their Iron Age forts, were not really in charge of territory so much as people. What do we mean by this? Well, let, let me then jump you one more step down from the Solway Firth, which is obviously here, showing Magnus here, so you can see what we're doing, uh, down to where I live, which is my cottage just south of Penrith. Now, my cottage, just to give you an idea of this fungible universe in which we live, uh, has not always been in a world, as you can imagine, in which there were naturally occurring species called England and Scotland. My cottage found itself initially in the tribal territory of the Carvetti. Then it found itself in this, to date, unnamed new tribal territory, recently identified by this scholar. Then it found itself as part of the Romano-British Kingdom of Reged, 
Fast forward about 50 years, it found itself part of Northumbria. A hundred years further on, it found itself on the edge of a Viking kingdom ruled from Dublin. Things seemed pretty straightforward. In 926 AD, with Athelstan of England, came along and put my cottage firmly in England, putting the English frontier at Emont Bridge, two miles north of my cottage. Unfortunately, at the time of the Doomsday Book, my cottage appears to have dropped out again because the Doomsday Book stops at Kendall, stops about 12 miles south of my cottage, at which point my cottage was not in England and not in Scotland either. Scotland still seemed to have stopped at Emont Bridge. My cottage was in, in no man's land, or should we say, no king's land. Right? This is a type of affairs that's easy to understand because actually all these borders I'm talking about the border at Emont Bridge, the border at Shap above Kendall, are geological frontiers. And how does this work? Well, it works as follows. If you were to walk out of my cottage and walk over the top of the hill, two miles as the crow flies, into Ullswater. How many people here in this room have been to Ullswater? Hey, brilliant. OK, that's very good. OK, walk over the top of the hill from the Lowther Valley into Ullswater. You cross a border between where I am, which is on the edge of sandstone and limestone, into the volcanic ridges of the Lake District. Now, why does geology matter? Geology matters because it affects rainfall and it affects topography in the following fashion. When you are next to my cottage, the rainfall, it's difficult to believe this, but the rainfall is 27 inches a year. Down on the edge of the Eden, the soil, rich loam soil, is nine feet deep on free draining sandstone. You can grow quick rye grass on that field. You can feed a cow on less than an acre, climb up the hill over the top to the hills above Ull's water. The rainfall suddenly becomes up to 68 inches a year. You walk over bare rock. The soil, when it exists at all, is thin and densely acidic. You wouldn't want to try to feed a cow up on the land above Ull's water. You might be able, in the acre which fed a cow in Eden Hall, to feed almost a sheep. If you tried to feed a cow, you would need between nine and ten acres to feed a single cow. This is a geological boundary, but it's also a boundary of territories, because where I am, starting back here on the sandstone limestone, is surrounded by Anglian place names. These Northumbrian, originally Germanic people who wafted over in the fifth and sixth century, so everything's called Helton, Bampton, Ascombe. Pop over the top of the hill and suddenly you find yourself in a completely different dialect surrounded by Norse Viking place names. Suddenly you find everything ending in Thwaite. There are things called Swindale, named after Viking pigs. Why? Because the geology drives a different agriculture. In order to survive in Ullswater, you have to tear these rocks out of the soil. You have to build dry stone walls. You have to cut relentlessly into the rushes and the bracken. You need to heft your wild, tough sheep to the hill and hope that their manure burns off some of the reeds. You have to drain continually. This kind of back-breaking work is the work of the Viking Norse settler. It is not the work of the Anglian down here on the sandstone, limestone plain. And then, and I'm going to finish soon, <laughs> everything changes. Everything changes because the Romans arrive. And the Romans draw a straight line, a mathematically straight line, like this across the border. We know this kind of line. It's the kind of line we associate with colonial empires. It is exactly the same straight line that I, when I was serving in Nasiriyah in Iraq, looked across at Saudi Arabia, the line drawn by Gertrude Bell with a ruler. 80 miles straight, totally ignoring any features of topography, geology, through marshlands, through fields. We can now see from aerial photography that there were Iron Age plows running under the line of what became the Roman wall. They went straight through the middle of fields. The Carvetti, my favorite people, this Iron Age tribe who lived near my cottage, 40 miles south of the wall, 
were unlucky enough to have a sacred shrine to their god Cosidius, which ended up being marooned seven miles north of the Roman Wall in Bewcastle. They were cut off by this structure. And what were the features of this artificial structure? Well, all these features, which I'm now going to enumerate, are features which oddly, and this is the paradox which I hope we can discuss today, oddly enough mean that an artificial frontier is much stronger and more permanent in the formation of identity than a natural frontier. Right? We like to believe, intuitively, that somehow geological natural frontiers are more powerful. What the Romans discovered in this country by building that wall, and of course what I'm about to suggest through building that wall, creating ultimately the distinction between England and Scotland, is that the artificial frontier creates sovereign nations and through the creation of sovereign territory creates identity. So what is this Roman wall? Number one, arbitrary. Number two, enormous. This is the most astonishing construction you can imagine. Walk along that wall, every 300 yards is a tower, every mile a castle, every seven miles a fort containing between 500 and 1,000 soldiers. Approach the wall, not running along it, but come towards it perpendicular from Scotland, you find yourself facing, initially, a 15-foot ditch, sorry, 15-foot mound, an 18-foot ditch, a straight 20-foot area which was laid with spikes, then the wall itself, 14 feet high, over the top of the wall, two military roads, Behind them, another ditch, and an even huger construction called the Vallum, nearly 20 feet high, and beyond those, a line of other forts, because the Roman wall is not just a wall. It's a huge chunk of territory dividing the south from the north. On the south side are Roman people. You pay taxes. Ultimately, you become a citizen. You're conscripted into the army. Further south, there are villas, there are bathhouses, there are procurators to look after you, there are official religions, there are temples. North of the wall, it's not quite clear what's happening. North of the wall, of course, there are objects. The Romans shift up and down again, up and down again. So Agricola pushes north, Septimus Severus pushes north, and as they do so, certain bits of detritus are left around but ultimately it never becomes in the same way as the territory south of the wall, part of Rome. You are a barbarian. If you want to come south of that wall, we know this from the German frontier, you can only cross the frontier with special permission, unarmed and escorted by Roman troops. And this is only granted to you if you are from very particular favored tribal groups. Along this wall too, weirdness. Dacians, Sarmatians. Uh, at one point it appears that we have Spanish on the western end of the wall, Tungrians and Batavians in the centre, people using African cooking pots, people who use strange things from the edge of the Black Sea, something called a falx, which is a killing item made in the shape of a sickle, all laid along this wall, dividing these kingdoms and somewhere pushing the whole thing to keep going, 10,000 soldiers for 300 years, driven by the insanity of empire, the insanity of occupation, the desire of the Roman army to justify its own existence by inventing threats that don't exist. What we would today call a military industrial complex. Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan written large, and on a much, much larger scale. The Romans at their peak, in order to justify their presence in Britain, kept 40,000 professional paid Roman soldiers in a territory that probably contained just over 2 million people. To achieve similar proportions in Afghanistan or Iraq would be to keep 550,000 coalition troops on the ground. In fact, we never crossed 150,000. And as I move towards my culmination, what then happens? Well, of course, you assume that this line on the map is never going to last. We do this all the time. We keep saying Iraq's not a real country. Afghanistan's not a real country. These are cutting tribal peoples. It's never going to survive. And indeed, initially, 
When the Romans leave, it looks as though that's happening. A kingdom called Northumbria spreads all the way up to Edinburgh and down to the Humber. A kingdom called Strathclyde stretches from Glasgow right the way down to my cottage and the edge of Shap. But gradually, as this peculiar bunch of people from Ireland called the Scots begin to push south, and a peculiar bunch of people called the West Saxons from Winchester begin to push north, they squeeze these middle kingdoms out of existence, and the line they find turns out to be at the precise point of the Solway, the precise point of the Roman Wall. Now, the frontier moves back and forth, and we can talk about why it isn't exactly the line of the Roman Wall later, but I want to finish with one image. Why is it that Rome's wall matters? Why are we the creation of Rome's wall? It is because what Rome creates is sovereignty. What Rome creates is a state. And when you see the Scots rebelling against Edward I, what they are fighting for, what Bruce is fighting for, what Wallace is fighting for, is not an ethnic group, but a realm, what they call the community of the realm. The people who are fighting against the English can't be called Scots at all. In fact, famously, the Battle of Standard, when King David of Scotland addresses his people, he says, and it must have been a bit of a mouthful before you start a battle, he says, my people, English, Flemish, Scots, British, let's go, right? It's a bit of a mouthful. He's very aware that the people who live in southern, what was to become southern Scotland, had until recently been Northumbrians, spoke English, and had much closer connections with people in Penrith than they did with people in Perth. But the Romans create, through the artificial frontier, the idea of the state. The idea of the state creates the territory, creates the community of the realm, and out of the community of the realm, not out of the natural frontier, not out of the ethnic identity, comes Scottish nationalism. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
And you would feel, in a way that you don't today, so having started thinking there is no border, then thinking actually it's quite stark, I began to realize nuances. One of the things you realize if you talk uh, to a Canadian, for example, or indeed any of us when we go on holiday, there is, it seems to me, a difference between being in your own country and in somebody else's. Even if the other country is as developed, as respecting of rights, as advanced, nevertheless, the millimeter you cross that border, you cease to be a citizen. It's no longer your government. You can't complain about the government. I at least feel in exactly the same way as if you were the person who'd elected that government. You've no longer elected it. It's no longer yours. Your attitude towards its army begins to become subtly different. If you're arrested by the police, I find, having been arrested by the police in a number of countries, I don't feel as comfortable even in France or the United States with the police as I feel in Britain. By this, I don't mean any insult to the French or American police. I simply feel that as a citizen, my attitude towards my own police force is subtly different from my attitude towards somebody else's police force. So uh, that, that's a sort of wombling way of saying there is a border, but I think it could become much starker. And, and therefore, uh, as you are also represent a party which is committed to a union which uh, regards that, that, that border as well, accepts it, nevertheless is not necessarily the defining part of that union. Do you think that sort of historical imperative which you've been talking about outweighs the attempts to hold two parts of the kingdom together? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose I, I'm becoming more gloomy. Uh, I mean, I'm a unionist, so I, when I say I'm becoming more gloomy, I'm becoming more doubtful about the possibility in the long run of holding everything together. Um, because what I think holds a country together is a sense, and this comes back to my idea of what matters really as shared state institutions, so what I think held Britain together was a pride in Britain, which was also a pride in British institutions, a pride in the British army, a pride in the British parliament, a sense which was available, I think, to Scots in the 19th century that being part of Britain was an opportunity to participate in something magnificent, where you might feel that, I don't know, if you were Adam Smith going to Oxford University, that was something to be proud of, that you might want to claim Oxford University as part of your country, despite the fact that you were a Scot, that you enjoyed the ambiguities and possibilities there. My sense is that we're losing faith in Britain. Britain doesn't make much sense. And the great edge that Scottish nationalism has, its attraction lies in the fact that there is no British nationalism really to speak of now. It, it's falling to pieces so quickly that the Olympics opening ceremony is not a sufficient replacement for the kinds of forms of British nationalism that existed in the past. And that ironically, the only thing that's likely to hold the union together is not faith, but indifference. That actually, if the Scottish Nationalist Party is currently getting a great advantage from the fact that British nationalism has no real resonance, they may in the end be defeated by the possibility that Scottish nationalism ceases to have real relevance or appeal. And that if the union stays together at all, it's, it's because of the defeat of nationalism in general, which has bad and disturbing implications for Britain. It's almost unionism by default rather than through conviction. Um, and, and I've got one more question before, as I'm sure there'll be many, many questions from the audience. But you told me that as you went across and you talked to a lot of people, that actually you were struck by, uh, despite this Scottishness, uh, a lack of conviction about Scotland and, um, and, and by definition, therefore, lack of conviction about an independent Scotland that people didn't feel very strongly. In fact, I think you told me they didn't really feel very strongly one way or the other. It wasn't a question that was sort of central to their, to their beliefs. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the I, I think this is important. I, I think clearly we imagine, or at least I imagine, when we talk about nationalism, that what you're talking about is, is history and, and soil and blood, 
I mean, it's very easy to, to think of nationalism in terms of 19th century European nationalisms, to imagine it, as you might imagine, to produce a sort of cliche of sort of 19th century Hungarian nationalism, to imagine that it's about some great heroic past leader, the purity of the Hungarian people, some great civilizational achievements, some defeat and destruction, some revival which is going to bring us back. What's striking today is we live in a very ahistorical context. People's sense of history is either uh, hardly existent or it's strong, but it's very academic in its tinge. I mean, I was very struck walking around Flodden Battlefield with a local historian. Now, if he'd been, I believe, a Victorian local historian, he would have had a real sense of the way in which Flodden related to that exact area and the way in which his daily walks, perhaps, or the soil or the stones somehow resonated with the memory of Flodden. Today, although the individual was a local, the way that they talked about it was very much in the language of, of modern academic discourse. There was uh, a lot of funny jokes about how incompetent James IV was. There was conversations about the technology of the canon. There were interesting new theories which may or may not have been lifted from David Starkey about the nature of the Scottish Renaissance. Um, but you didn't feel it rested in a place. And I had this again this morning. I, I was writing, uh, the reason I look completely bizarre is I didn't sleep last night. And I got up at 5.30 in the morning and I've been out at the uh, ridings uh, up at saint Croix, which is, um, which we were in, in the rain on our horses from half past five till half past midday. And the man I was talking to, I said to him, why are you proud of this place? And he said, we have the oldest post office in Scotland. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, what do you mean, why? It's self-evident. We have the oldest post office in Scotland. <laughs> and I said, no, but it's not self-evident. I mean, you can't just have one post office. I mean, there's no point to one post office. It must have been set up with another post office. You can send your post anywhere. <laughs> I mean, is the point, perhaps, I suggested, that there was a post office in many other places, but yours is the longest continuously existing post office? And thought about it a little bit. And then he said, well, I, you know, I think it's been there since 1735. And I said, so after the Act of Union, and he said, oh, no, long before that. Now, what, 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 I'm, what, I'm, what I suppose I'm getting at is that whatever his sense of identity, soil, locality was, um, it wasn't quite the kind of thing that, that Walter Scott tried to imagine or tried to impregnate into the Scottish soul, or even the kind of thing. I mean, Magnus is good on quoting Robert Louis Stevenson on on a Scottish sense of history. In fact, since I can't remember the quote, I'm going to hand this over to Magnus. Well, uh, I've forgotten it, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's no good. <laughs> um, but uh, it strikes me that that has gone. And so whatever remains in Scottish nationalism is... can be when I interview people. I've interviewed now, I've got a, 120 hours of tapes. And a lot of the time, People are not talking about blood and soil and history and landscape. They're talking about uh, the miners' strike and Mrs. Thatcher. They're talking about a particular idea they have of Denmark or Scandinavia. Mm. Uh, they're talking about a particular idea that Alex Salmond is somehow more authentically Scottish than Gordon Brown or Alistair Darling because he didn't go south of the border and he's retained his accent in a better way. Uh, they talk about... <laughs> London being different to Scotland, but it, it doesn't pass into great statements about Vikings or Romans, <coughs> Celts or Flodden, Jacobites, or even the Industrial Revolution. I think this is a fascinating and extremely important question, the, the question of Scottish identity and whether it exists, if it exists at all, why does it exist, and does it draw... it? it probably, as Rory says, no longer draws on uh, memories of battles fought and lost or history because people are very badly taught, anyway, in schools. Uh, the last talk here was about ballads. Uh, I don't think ballads are a hugely important influence any longer. So what are we grasping at when we talk about Scottish identity? And I think this is a very important issue. So. Uh, I think 
Best to uh, say that we've got um, 10 minutes of questions, and if you would stick up your hand and wait for a microphone to come, and then we'll go to you. And there's one back there and one here. Can you? Right over there. Thanks. Um, I want to talk about walking a bit, actually, um, partly because it, it, it struck me that given that culture is largely responsible for determining Scottish identity, and uh, Burns and Walter Scott, our two greatest creators of that identity, were both great walkers. And down in England, I think a lot of the English identity is defined by that era of war poets, Brooke, Gurney, Edward Thomas, who were terrific walkers. Whereas today, perhaps, perhaps our culture is defined more by people who stay in cities, don't walk, live in cities, write about cities, and write about international uh, things in terms of our theatre, our poetry, our filmmaking. Is there a link, do you think, between walking and, and, and the way in which culture defines our identity? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think very, very strongly. Um, so, so you're right, of course. A lot of what formed English nationalism, Scottish nationalism, British nationalism came out of people who walked and wrote about walking. Uh, the point about walking is that you travel very slowly through generally an intensely rural landscape. I mean, most walkers, and certainly most poets who walked, tended to avoid work walking through urban or suburban spaces very much. They liked walking because it allowed you to leave roads, it allowed you to cross remote and desolate hillsides. In doing so, they learnt to see different kinds of things in the landscape. So, to start with a, a local figure from, from Carr Luke, uh, Roy, General Roy, who was a, a great traveller in Scotland in the, the mid-18th century, for him what he saw as he walked through the landscape was an obsessive concern with Roman remains. So that was really a tradition that stretched from 1580 to about 1750. Camden too, when he produces a map of Britain Every place name, if he can, is a Roman place name. He sticks the names of Roman tribes and Roman forts all over his map of, of Britain in 1600. The next phase, of course, is more interesting. It's the phase of Walter Scott, where Scott, drawing on things that have happened in the past, begins to find things which are not so much Roman in the landscape. He begins to weave in more aggressively oral history. You know, he invests very heavily as a young man, of course, in collecting ballads and links those into landscapes. So he turns up, actually not on foot, but on a pony and trap in Liddlesdale, but weaves in very strongly that oral history which he gets from walking cottages. Now, the response to that from the Romantics, though, is odd. What's odd about the Romantics is for them, walking, although important for Coleridge and Wordsworth, in fact, central to their identity, isn't really about nationalism at all. Very, very striking is that although Wordsworth says in the Preludes that he was tempted as a young man to write a great poem about William Wallace, he never actually does so. The Preludes turn out to barely, barely feature national identity at all. I mean, you know, you might suddenly get Milton thou shalt be living in this hour, England has need of thee, but basically the structure of Wordsworth's sense of the landscape is the blasted hawthorn, the stone wall, the sheep in the rain, an attempt to achieve a sublime and necessarily non-national specific engagement with the world, with the universe, with nature, represented in some form as God. Then, to come forward to the Edwardians in the First World War, we have this extraordinary movement from the 1850s through to about 1920, where walking takes off again with people who are often retired, uh, or, or not even retired, still functioning clergymen. I mean, my, my part of Cumbria is, is littered, and indeed the Scottish countryside, littered with people, educated people from universities who spent 40 years living in small villages, trying to find out things to say about those villages, till they had deciphered every inscription, recorded every stone, put everything together, and that begins to get into the tourist guidebooks, which guide people walking in Strathern, walking in the Lake District by the 20s. And then I think you're right. Something begins to happen. If your sense of nationalism is overly connected to the specific landscape and soil, 
And if your sense of history is overly connected to local history, then the move from walking to a city-based life and to moving around in a motor car undermines some of the most basic ingredients of that late national identity. Yeah. Uh, here, first of all, and then yeah. Hello? Yeah. Uh, going back to the union and um, related issues, I just wonder if the, the uh, coherence of the union from 1707 through to the last 50 years was driven by the shared endeavor and adventure of the Industrial Revolution and of empire, and that the sort of perception of a declining opportunity set is behind our sort of increased navel gazing regarding union. <coughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that you're right. I mean, I think if you look at particularly one very, very powerful form of British I identity, which is associated not very far away. I mean, if you just get over towards bigger with John Buchan, for example, uh, or indeed actually to some extent with Scott, you're beginning to see uh, the sense that empire is what replaces the previous narratives. It's very striking that in Walter Scott's history, his, his tales of a grandfather, he basically finishes with the Jacobite Rebellion. He says, after that, there really isn't any history to speak of. Scotland doesn't really have any independence history. From now onwards, Scottish history is associated uh, with the larger operations of the empire. Why? Because identity through the empire is really exciting. It gives you a type of history you can't have at home. Why is the end of history for Walter Scott, the Jacobite Rebellion? Why does Buchan really lose interest at about the time of Montrose? Well, because they like battles, they like wars. I mean, it's a bit like I was trying to interview some poor Cumbrian farmer uh, next to a stone circle at Castlerigg. And his family have lived there, as far as one can tell, for 700 years. And I kept saying, any oral history, any stories you can give me here? And finally he said, no, no, no. And then he said, no, wait a second. My aunt once saw a leopard in India. <laughs> I, I wonder to what extent your thesis would change, uh, would, have, or would have changed if your cottage, rather than being in Cumbria, was, um, say, a house in Berlin or currently on the West Bank. OK, well, I think... Totally. I mean, my, my friend, uh, Gerald Knaus, who I just wrote a, a, a book with a year and a half ago, uh, is completely mystified by the fact that I'm even beginning to think about these issues. I mean, as far as he's concerned, he's an Austrian. Uh, borders are offensive and irrelevant. The main attraction of the European Union for him seems to be Schengen and the open border policy. He says he has no interest in living in Austria. He finds Austrian politics boring, and he thinks that's a good thing. He thinks it's good they're boring. Uh, he doesn't want having to do with them because they're boring, but he thinks that's a sign of civilization. Uh, and he would think that this entire conversation that we're having is completely bizarre. Uh, that there are elements of it that sound sinister, because they would be reminiscent of 19th century discourses on race, ethnicity, and nationalism. Uh, but there are other elements of it that he would just think are trivial. And what he would actually conclude, and I think this may be an important part of what's happening with Scottish nationalism, he would say all that's happened is the European Union, that Scotland is a region that's worked out that if it becomes a state within the structure of the European Union, it has more access to the goodies that the European Union can deliver, and that where Scotland goes, Bavaria will follow. Um, I must again <clears throat> just sort of insert one thought that Rory sort of hasn't mentioned, but is very much the view of uh, revision, re the modern generation of revisionist historians in Scotland, which is to address the very interesting question of why after 1707 Scotland continued to exist as a separate entity, because at that point it was entirely possible it was just become North Britain, and indeed that was what was meant to happen. And in fact, very much thanks to Walter Scott, Scotland reinvented itself and began draping itself in tartan, discovered Highland history, the hated Highlands, of course, would be been anathema to lowland Scotland, and found through that medium an identity which is still the most obvious and defining 
emblem of, of, of the modern Scottish nation. So, so we've got time for two more questions, one and two. Um, I would like to ask, when you define nationality in terms of or identity, uh, uh, you mentioned the soil and, and culture, but somehow, somehow Britain's also a community of values and in a, on a sort of global perspective, but th there's less a debate on this. It, it may be an argument for union or, or not. Being a Bavarian, you know, I, I feel I should have less of a voice saying, you know, whether Scotland should be uh, uh, independent or not. But, uh, you know, the question really is, um, you know, do you think there's something missing in terms of a, a discussion of this sort of set of values that joins us? Yes, I think there is. <coughs> but I think the problem is that when you try to put your finger on what those values are, it becomes very difficult to identify. And Magnus has written very well about this. I mean, traditionally we would say in Scotland, for example, that one of the defining values of Scotland is, is the incredible quality of the Scottish educational system. Now, it's questionable whether that's still true, right? I mean, whether these are myths that we've inherited and whether... And, and in fact, values in general are difficult now. I mean, it is true that if you're talking about, to go right back to the very beginning of this talk about Rome, it's very clear that that is a place held together by values. Values which really, over a period, they thought of 800 years, I mean, they exaggerate their history, bind them together. A sense that it's very easy for Agricola to compare himself to Caesar, despite the fact they live in very different generations. It's not clear to me that we live in that kind of world anymore because we've hollowed out the sphere of the public. We've hollowed out the citizen. We've lost our loyalty to parliament or to the institutions of government. A country that has no feeling for the public sphere, a country that tends to either be interested in international events, be interested in climate change or signing up to Oxfam to help somebody at the other end of the world, or locks themselves at home and thinks that their whole life revolves around being nice to their family and bringing up their family well. And completely abandons the middle sphere, the sphere between Kofi Annan and your front door, right? the sphere that used to be, the sphere of the nation, the citizen, the public sphere, is, is a country that's going to really struggle to produce clear values which can differentiate itself from its neighbours. There was one final question there. Uh, the question really was to do with institutions because one of the things that haven't been mentioned yet was the separate institutions within Scotland of church, of law and of education which was touched on briefly because I think they were actually have been very important in sustaining a separate sense of Scottish identity <coughs> from the Act of Union up to the present time and I'd be interested to have your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's a brilliant way of finishing. So um, I if I began by putting forward an idea that what really creates a sense of nation is a territory with shared institutions, right? Not, not some sense of blood or soil, but simply a territory with shared institutions. That's what explains why people on one side of the border see themselves as English and the other Scottish. That works very well in relation to Scotland. That phenomenon that I felt I was observing along the border, where it's not quite a frontier, but it's a sort of border, is exactly because Scotland has retained so many institutions. It hadn't, until recently, had a fully independent parliament. It still doesn't have a fully independent parliament. It shares an army. So in that sense, that erodes some of the border lines and creates a, sh a sense of shared identity, a sense of British identity. But as you say, the other things are so powerful and strong, not just the things you've mentioned, not just church and law, but also the fact that there are endless Scottish societies like the Scottish Royal Geographical Society or the fact that you're surgeons train themselves in, in Glasgow as opposed to training themselves with a English Royal College, that these learned institutions themselves, independent newspapers, all reinforce this sense of separate identity. So that border that is a border, isn't quite a border, is a border that might be a potential border, retains its attraction appeal because so many of those institutions were retained. Fascinating stuff. <clears throat> the, I'm, I'm going to call for that any minute now, William. Don't be too previous, because Ro Rory was sort of teasing me that I'd forgotten a bit of Robert Louis Stevenson, which is true that I had.
But of course, the defining factor that he hasn't mentioned was uh, when the Scots stopped drinking claret. And uh, the bit of doggerel that we all know is, bold and erect the Caledonian stood, stern was his visage and his claret good. <laughs> Let them drink port, the English tyrant cried. He drank the poison and his spirit died. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I thought that was an absolutely fascinating and thought-provoking uh, talk. Would you please give your thanks to Rory Stewart? <laughs>